Well, as was mentioned in the children's story today, when I was a young kid, one of the things I was most afraid of in the entire world was strong weather and storms. I think it goes back to an experience that I had when I was six or seven growing up in Grand Prairie, just a few minutes down the road from here. And my family lived on a street that wasn't yet really uh, developed in the same way that some other residential or suburban neighborhoods were. And so my neighbors had horses. There were cows and chickens next door that would sometimes get out and block the road when I was on my bike or riding to my grandparents' house. They lived just down the street from me. And there was a creek that ran just at the back of my backyard. And when I was six or seven, there was a week when it just wouldn't stop raining. It just didn't stop. So we watched as the water at the creek became higher and higher, as the creek became something more powerful, and as the water got closer and closer to the house. I can remember as a little kid standing on the back porch with my parents, my grandparents, my uncle, and a few friends watching as people's possessions, pieces of their homes, started to move through what was not a creek anymore, but a river rushing through an acre in the backyard. The fence that held our yard broke apart in front of our eyes, and I watched the pieces float. The fort that I had climbed into as a kid so many times turned over and floated away in the water, and I remember like it was yesterday watching a horse moving through the water, wondering when it was coming for us. And the water got closer and closer, and so we put furniture up on cinder blocks, and my friends and family, my neighbors came over with sandbags, and we were putting them out watching the water, and it got over the fence, and then up to the driveway, and then up to the garage, and then up to the back door, and I remember watching the water start to creep in the back room of the house, and then just stop. It went away. We had very little damage of anything that truly mattered, no people. And I watched in that moment and learned a lesson that in times of need, people showed up for one another. I saw my grandparents and my uncle, my friends, working hard to ensure that what we had might be protected with sandbags and pushing water out with big brooms. A really futile kind of enterprise. It just kept coming back. But you do what you can. And even though I remember watching people show up for one another as a kid, I remember thinking that that didn't seem to make me less afraid. Because they could put the sandbags out, they could help, they could put furniture up, but what they couldn't do was stop the rain. And I remember after that until well into my early adulthood having those same feelings come up whenever a strong storm would come, whenever we would watch, as you do in North Texas so often growing up, a tornado in the background or those green skies, that smell, or the sound of a train that meant there was a tornado or a strong storm. As a kid, going to Methodists and later Baptist churches and hearing a lot of scriptural stories, I was drawn to that story that Daniel read earlier of Jesus making the storm go away. As a little kid hearing that in Bible study classes or in church, I often thought, that sounds like a guy I can trust. <laughs> I would love someone who could ensure that there were no more storms. It was a thing. I was more than normal afraid of those storms. And the idea that there was someone, somebody who could just make them go away was incredibly compelling to eight-year-old Aaron and 40-year-old Aaron. One of the things that interests me so much about that story is how upset the teacher's students are that he's not upset. 
Here is someone that they believe, some of them, they're not in agreement about who he is, but some of his disciples and students believe that he is the manifestation of a living God. Some think he, that he might be a human teacher, a rabbi. Some think he's a political revolutionary coming to build a new nation or a state, some the promised Messiah of their faith and their people. And yet, when he's asleep in the middle of a storm, with his head, it says, on a pillow, they can't get over the fact that he's not scared like they are. Now, in the ancient Near East, the water was frightening. The people who lived in that time and place did believe that in some of the seas there were monsters, real monsters, beneath the waves. You didn't want to go over the boat. Nobody does. But their response is not, why aren't you scared you might drown? It's, why aren't you scared that we might drown? And they personalize his non-reactive response, you must not care about us. How familiar that is to me. Why aren't you as upset as I am about this? Why don't you care about me? Here's these people who, in the midst of an example of someone who seems to get it, don't want him calm, cool, and collected. To them, care looks like him being as upset as they are. He uses a word to describe them when he says, why are you so afraid? And the word in the Christian scriptures in the Greek version is dilos. It's only used three times in the entire Bible, twice to describe this storm and once in the book of Revelation to talk about people who don't go to heaven. I know we're universalists, but still. There's another word for fear that gets used in the Bible as normal, good, decent fear, phobos, but not this word. This is the kind of fear that keeps you from experiencing heaven. What's going on there? This story shows up in all of what's called the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and when it shows up in all of those, it means the people who were editing these stories thought it was really important. Why are you so afraid, he says. Let's assume that he doesn't make the storm go away. Let's assume that in fact the teacher, when he stands up on the boat and says, quiet, calm down, is not talking to the rain. And maybe to the scared companions in the boat with him. What does he get that they and we or I don't? Here's a person who in the text it says, whose mere presence with other people seems miraculous. I wonder if it's not because he could make their sickness go away, if not because he could make the rain stop raining, but because he knew what it was like to be fragile and frail and finite and understood that the most important thing we can do is show up for each other. Maybe deep in his bones was the kind of person who knew the rain will come whether you want it to or not. And one day, all these fragile bodies will die, and those among us who are sick and poor might be sick and poor again, and so why don't we spend the one life we have loving one another? Care does not always look like removing problems, but rather by being present in the midst of the storm. But so often in my life, and I know in others, the way that we respond to being fundamentally out of control, which we are, at least as far as the big things are concerned, how we respond to being fundamentally out of control affects how we learn to love one another, how we show up for tangible people that matter in our lives. Because so often care looks like control or fear. Think of how we respond when people don't tell us what's going on in their lives. We want information and access. I need to know. Why won't you let me take care of you? Think of how often we are responsive to other people not knowing the secrets of our lives. 
not telling anybody that something's wrong with us and being mad that they didn't try and take care of us for it. Think of how often care is not actually presence for others, but an attempt to make their difficult emotions go away because they make us feel bad. I don't like the way you make me feel anymore. You're not as happy as you used to be. You seem sad. What's wrong with you? Can I take care of it? No? What's wrong with you? Or just the assumption that we sometimes carry that the love of another human being would make sure we didn't have any problems anymore. A narrative sold on Valentine's Day. If they just love me, everything else will be fine. Maybe the rain will stop and I won't get sick and I won't grow old and I'll be super smart and rich. If they just love me. But that's not exactly how it works. And I think that the most profound lessons we learn about being loved and loving, about being held and holding, about being cared for and caring for others do not come from our moments of strength or control but rather from our moments of absolute dependence and, in fact, weakness. Think of the first lessons you learn about asking for help. You don't ask for help because you're doing fine. I've never run around asking for help because I felt like I had enough money, I was healthy, I was competent, and I could do this by myself. I asked for help because I needed it. The first lessons we learn about being cared for happen when we can't walk or speak, when we're infants in the arms of someone who cares for us, completely unable to eat, to bathe, to hold our necks up even. The first thing we learn about being held is being utterly dependent. We're like being a child in the arms of a parent when we're sick, like in the poem. A parent who knows that holding us and reading a story will not solve an illness. But it will do something more important. I remember as a kid, my mother bringing me saltine crackers and 7-Up. No matter what illness I had. <laughs> It was like communion, like magic. It doesn't make you better, but it does. How many images of God do we have that are like that loving parent? No wonder when we try to name the mystery beyond all naming, it often looks like a parent holding us. Maybe not one who can make the sickness go away, maybe not one who can stop the rain, but one who will keep holding us, keep reading the story, maybe long after we've fallen asleep. I think particularly for people like us, this church, in a faith tradition that brags about its children's SAT scores, that feels very good about how smart and right we often are, situated in a neighborhood that screams control over life, with expertly manicured lawns and help to manage a household and roads that are paved and police that show up very quickly when you call them, especially probably if you look like me. In a neighborhood like this, that screams control over life, in a tradition like this one, that proclaims how intelligent and in control human beings can be, I think it is important that we start listening to the teacher in us, not that is the control or the intelligent or the agent, but the teacher in us that knows when it comes to the big issues, we are out of control. Because the more we make friends with that feeling, the more we're able to show grace to people in our lives. When someone you love is sick and will not get better, they don't need someone who can make them well. They need someone who will sit with them until their story is finished. When someone is scared of the storms in their life 
or the literal ones outside, they do not need someone who can stop the rain. They need someone who will sit with them until the rain stops or until it doesn't. So much of how we understand loving other people means controlling them or making sense of the world and life's uncertainty, but the God of love that we talk about here does not work with the math of deserve. The God of love that we talk about and experience here does not make the rain fall on some people and not on others, and there's no way you can pray to make it start or stop. When it comes to the biggest, most important issues of our life, we really aren't in control. How will your children's lives turn out? It's really not up to you. Will you get sick and will you die? Yes. Will the person you live with love you or leave you? That is not in your control. And when we make friends with the part of ourselves that knows that, then we begin to see that there's nothing we can do to earn the blue sky, and it is a gift. There's nothing we can do to learn, earn the love of a friend or companion, and it is a gift beyond all measure that nobody deserves to get sick, and nobody deserves good music. Nobody deserves life being lost, and no one really deserves it being given. It just is. The truth of the matter is that in our lives, sometimes there are monsters in the water. Sometimes the rains won't stop. Sometimes we get sick and we, love, we lose the ones we love. And what do we have in the midst of that? A God who will cast no one out of the circle of love and concern, who holds and reads the story through its finish. Sometimes there are monsters in the water and the rain doesn't stop, and what do we have? People. People in this room and in our lives who have promised that they cannot stop the rain, but they will hold us until it stops. What do we have? Not control over the seas. Not control over life's mysteries. But the miraculous ability to stay with one another. Whether the rain stops or not, whether we get better or don't, but to stay with one another until this place feels more like heaven. May it be so, and amen.